prayer hands. Please, for this moment, as we descend once again onto the Apex Legends battlefield, does the map um, like have a specific sort of reference name? I know that World's we're, Edge. I know we're on World's Edge, and then before it was King's Land. But is it a battlefield? Is it a map? Is it like a map? Uh, I th I think you call is it. Is there official you terminology? Call it a map. Uh, Glitter used a different word for the end game that I think you could call it at times as well. Uh, that <laughs> okay, we can't, we can't say that on, on stream. <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll go with map. We'll go with map. All right, cool. Well, yeah, as we descend once again onto the Apex Legends map, Apex Legends universe, we're ready to go with match number three. Guys, are you raring, ready and raring to go with it? Absolutely. Yeah, I just want to get into it again. I think the quicker we get through these games, the more exciting the stories become and the hotter the players stay. So I think that's the best thing to do. Yeah, and I think they are ready to go. So that means we head on over to our university lecturer, Dreadnought, and his cohort, the military maestro, Bravo. Thank you, Paula. Far too kind for the over-the-top introductions every time. Uh, Bravo alongside Dreadnought here to bring you this next game as they burst into laughter. On the I, that's side. what I'm Studio. upset about. Every time it's, too. it's just Snickers over there, just yep. like, ha, how curious and hilarious we are while we mock those simpletons over there. It's, uh, it is unfair, to say the least, but the top of the bracket is getting even closer. We only have an eight-point difference between T1 and TSM now in second, and brings up the point we were talking about earlier at the beginning of the day. We were wondering, is TSM just going to slowly claw their way back and prove everyone wrong? So far, they're continuing to do that. Yeah, and uh, you know, for me, I often I often evaluate greatness as basically being able to do what is expected of you with ease. And I feel like TSM has, uh, we already talked about that before, is like you shed doubt on them and when it matters, they just step up and they make right. it happen. And we're showing hints of that again today. And uh, to be honest, you know, there was a lot of conversation that if they win the preseason invitational, is it fair to call them the best team in the world. And I sat there and I confidently said, yeah, I think it is. Uh, if they do it here again after one day of doubt and just just absolutely smashing day number two, I yeah. mean, what, what can you say other than they, if they don't just rule the world, definitely North America is their kingdom. Absolutely. I think there's going to be, I think there's little doubt now based on their placing so far. It's hard to uh, really, you know, take anything away from them. And now based on what we've seen in day number two, that's the case as well. The third team, of course, the Sentinels only three points away from TSM. At the same time though, there is a cool kind of concept to think about with, you know, depending on whatever results come through here, is just that TSM clearly, when there was any amount of deviation from the standard of success, they struggled very heavily. So adaptation may not be a strength, right, as a roster when looking at it, because yeah. though they can still play the map with those correct characters, it's mainly uh, that synergy on a independent player level and what your team is capable of in those situations could be a lot harder. And yeah, I can tell you it's definitely a lot harder from a leadership standpoint when you don't necessarily know what you can and cannot do. And I think that that's something that going forward, maybe TSM might be looking to be able to clean up because I think it's shown here. Absolutely. I mean, each time it feels like, you know, you and I are on the desk, it, like this example is, is there's a ton of things that the TSM and the rest of the teams have had to get used to. And we saw them, like you said, playing around with Meta. So as we look forward for them, certainly going to be a challenge. However, the challenge ahead of them today is just a few more games games of Apex Legends as we get ready to jump in to this next game. As we talk about some of the rest of the teams on the table, of course, Pittsburgh Storm with a very big game there just now. Nine kills for DCOP. He owned the entire kill feed. I'm excited to see that clip as well because I almost question, I was like, I, I, I believe, yeah, I can't, I don't know what the secondary was, but he had a Peacekeeper in, 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 uh, as, as his primary weapon. Not sure where the secondary was, but the entire kill feed was him with Two different weapons, just filling the whole thing up. Yeah. Probably the the most the biggest string of kills that we have seen, uh, even at this event so far. So Pittsburgh Storm still only four points away from Sentinels. They have 73 points right now, sitting in fifth. Yeah, and even though I I, I don't want to take away what we just saw from the Pittsburgh Storm because it was definitely one of the better performances that they got, and they ended up getting a win even. On top of that, I do feel like there's still something left if they want to walk away with a win or anywhere near that, I think, top three. Because mm -hmm. even though they are a part of this conversation sitting at fifth right now, they had some good games yesterday that put them there, and then they kind of just, you know, hung out to where nobody weren't, were necessarily there to threaten them and knock them out. Yep. And uh, I think teams like Team Liquid Blue, we already see struggling with that. Some of those teams now here on day number two are kicking them out, and I can see Pittsburgh Storm, that happening to them if they, again, do that same kind of trajectory we got from them yesterday. Right, it's interesting. Even performances that look pretty good on paper, mm -hmm. Uh, are not going to be enough. So teams placing, like we talked about earlier, just because you're getting well inside the top six, if you're not stringing together the perfect performance in terms of kills and placement, other teams are going to surpass you. And it's going to be, uh, like we said earlier, a marathon here with four more games left for North America. Yeah, it is It is a while to try and strike that balance between the placements and the kills. And again, we have our theories so far and probably where 
it likely should fall and make you make that transition and focusing on one over the other. But it, it, I think it's really hard to be able to know when to make those calls. Yeah, we were even off the camera, you know, talking about the TSM pushing the house and controlling that. And I right. think revisiting that idea and thinking about all the information we knew we had and what we can expect them to maybe know at that point in time. It is really hard to even look at some of those choices and go, this was right or this was confidently wrong. Right. And I think the fact that TSM was able to still put together uh, that game that they did after kind of taking a house that they then had to move back out of also kind of speaks even more volumes about the fact that we've seen them claw out of ridiculous situations. And you could even see that yesterday with the performance they had, not what they wanted, what would have wanted to have on the board. A few teams were still looking to see a little bit more from definitely complexity. I think we have not seen them step up just yet. Rogue as well. They've moved into ninth. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's what I was going to just add is uh, they haven't, they haven't flip-flopped the entirety of the performance, but I would definitely say so far from what we've gotten out of Rogue, better than what we got out of yesterday. Signs yes. of life, right? Yep. Uh, all, all we need is the defibrillator to actually make something happen, it feels like, here for them, but it's very, very close. Right. Keep in mind, them being in ninth, uh, just a sixth-place performance in that last game, uh, top eight right is in the prize money here today so only one away and certainly like you said building some momentum lots of games yet to play though for north america so far and uh yeah i think the one thing that we need to know i think if we talk about kind of t teams being able to go one of two ways for the rest of the day sentinels is a big question mark in terms of do we see sentinels continue to play at the pace they are and maybe sit somewhere in the middle of the top eight? Yeah. Or are we going to see them really put the gas on and, and start to spread away? Youngins and Frex only at 76 points, only one point away. And then Pittsburgh Storm at 73, only four points away. So Sentinels have a lot of pressure on their back right now, points-wise. Yeah, they very much do. Uh, but I can't help but feel like if I was any team and I go, do you have a lot of pressure? It's T1. Um, yep. And the reason for that is, if you remember yesterday, I started off talking about some of the teams that had a lot of hype and then kind of disappeared when it came to, you know, the ramping up between X Games and uh, the preseason invitation. I feel like T1 absolutely was the embodiment of that. At X Games, they were some of the most outstanding killers, uh, rotations, yep. especially when it came to... I forgot the structure uh, with the, the high uh, secondary structure that got onto the revamped version of Kings Canyon. Uh, we're so very good at the cage uh, and controlling yeah. some of those areas. And it looked like they were going to be, you know, the next TSM, the baby TSM, uh, definitely a top two contender. And it kind of dissipated. Um, and I feel like them coming back in day number one, walking away first place, yeah. you see TSM in shambles. You feel like this is suddenly like, was the prophecy correct, right? Like, are we able to fulfill that? And now you're two games deep, and I'd be asking, what did you really do comparative to your performances yesterday? And yes, we aren't even halfway yet, but I'd say not nearly as uh, maybe impressive starting things off. Yeah, I agree. And I'll, T1 is a team that we also talked about the fact that, despite the fact that we know that there's such talented players there on that roster, 58th, in Poland, right? So we've looked at, I think you kind of put them, we talked earlier about the, the biggest improvements from Poland. T1 is definitely sitting there as of right now. Yeah, for but sure. But there are four more games to play as we start off our yeah, next game with the side of Pittsburgh Storm. Once again, Hodzik, Decop, and Salvo, that amalgamation of the Pittsburgh Nice and Tempo Storm, placing 29th and 42nd, respectively, in Poland. Let's see where they're ending up, where they're going to focus here when it comes to their initial drop. Does seem like there was a ping thrown down onto the geyser, but they aren't going to be able to make the full stretch out there. Going to have to land somewhere and make a trek. Question is, do they take the closest gap into it, or do they try and take the actual canal itself, or not the canal, but excuse me, the... Uh, that underpass. Yeah, yeah, the vault underpass there. Looks like, yep, still going ahead, and now going to land at crates momentarily, potentially loot up a bit. They're going to send... Decop in, though, the wraith towards the capital city outskirts for just a little bit of early scouting to see if there's any pressure there. Looks like going to have some help with Solve coming with him as well. It's going to be Hodzik who's going to go there through Underpass to see what Geyser looks like. And I'm, already, I'm just sitting here trying to figure out, so that is going to be the standard there for uh, Pittsburgh Storm. I was wondering, it's a bit of a stretch to be able to mix that up. And I do like the getting the side look here kind of on the outskirts based on the trajectory we got on that last ship. Clearly, I don't think on most of them you're always going to be able to get away with this right. kind of picking off some of the and scavenging some of the free food maybe that's left around here. Uh, but a team very, very close to them is Fnatic North America, just on basically just sitting north of them and walking directly into the location that we did see yeah. an isolated member actually drop there. So we'll see if Fnatic actually makes this push. We do see shots going out early and even a little bit of charge rifle usage there. You do see in the hands of Spirit, I believe, on their path. I mean, how do you find triple purple that soon? I, if I am Fnatic in A, I'm looking at this as this is my fight. My stats are I'm sitting seventh, seventh overall. I have 
I have an opportunity to make a something of myself and here. Keep in mind, they're going to know that Pittsburgh Knights is, is a from scrams that they are a geyser drop. So if they're starting to find players from the Knights and they get up that first knock, they're going to be even more confident to push there. Keep in mind, there was two players on the Knights that did go while a third did split. Hodzik did split towards Geyser. So we're going to be keeping an eye on them off screen to see what happens with that battle. Well, look at this. Team Liquid still holding the train yard and pretty effectively here. Got themselves a full three men here, so everybody's gonna everybody's gonna feel a little bit more comfortable than we did get in our last game from Team Liquid Blue. And a lot of my questions are gonna be about the rotation. I highlighted some of I felt like they were maybe sticking around a little bit too long on this train yard. It feels uh, like their jungle gym and that they're kind of the bully of the playground. Uh, but I do think that they might have to make it transition out sooner than we have seen from them at least here earlier in today. Little shot there on that cargo bot. That cargo bot's going to fall uh, west of train, and now it's a fly quest push who's gonna into get it. train as well. Who's going to get the cargo bot? The question: If your fly quest, you should have seen those shots come through. A triple take shot is got some of the biggest trail, much like a scout. There we Pretty go. Pretty loud as well. Yeah. Full reveal. They're going to wait for him as we hear there a little bit in the comms. Know that they're going to be. Like to try and get this push. If we do know, though, looking at the mini map, quite a bit of distance between all the members. Specifically, I believe it's Monsoon out there. It's a bit of a trek. Even if you drop a zip at the max distance there, it's still, I'd say, at least a 20 second rotation. Certainly, you saw a lot of pinks coming in there. Something you'll see from these sides, and Glitter pointed out on the analysis desk, is when you do see those pings in the mid game, it's typically, and we also saw it in the last game during one of the listen ins, it's players trying to communicate exactly which end circle they believe it is. So I want to really raise a point of concern, because keep in mind, we know where those targets are out in that field right now, but Monsoon has a mile to be able to travel, and basically everybody now is going to be looking at him because Lou ended up revealing the positioning that close to FlyQuest on it. Yes, you could say that they thought they were out in the field, and so that was why he didn't believe any pressure, but there was little scouting yep. over actual train yard itself, risking a positioning and now giving up information, and I personally feel like, that actually may be a reason that FlyQuest will struggle here in this game to get what they need to be able to walk away confident. Again, sixth overall, a team that we have a lot of hope for. Absolutely. Now, looking at Mirko and Reptar, unsurprisingly, they are flying out of fuel a little bit more central to try to head west just to get away from that push that they certainly heard coming from that top northern fuel choke. They wasted no time to get over here towards the mine pass. That choke that will also go up into train, so they need to decide exactly where they want to sit tight. Keep in mind, they've already lost Gabe. Okay, we'll make the transition here to the right-hand side. I just wonder if they're going to kind of stick on the outskirts or maybe go for that high ground positioning. We've seen a lot of teams favor here outside the mine pass. Seems like neither. as They kind of opt out of any tight corridor whatsoever. Anvil Hammer picked up here. See if anybody's got a nice wingman or 301, or excuse me, flatline or 301. I'll, I'll be honest, that's an attachment that doesn't go by in my book. Uh, it's a must-have for at least somebody, especially if you find yourself the flatline. Mm -hmm. That being said, the competitive world, a little bit more sweaty than my pleb lobbies. Let's be real. <laughs> now we're looking at Pittsburgh Knights. They are still at the ridge. And the, the one question I have, really, you find, anytime you find anyone at the ridge, is which of the tough chokes are they going to use to get out of it? There's not a lot of really pleasant ways outside of the ridge. And I'm not terribly surprised, actually, to see them go straight south into sorting because it helps them avoid some of the tougher areas to traverse. Yeah, sorting factory definitely has the better escape routes and exit transitions. Rise might be pushed on them, though. That's Rise zipping right behind them. And you see charge rifle shots coming out right away. Yeah, sitting down actually directly below is going to be... I think it was going to be, in fact, JKW that was taking the first glance. Either way, still chipping away here. Not able to land here with the wingman. Without any optics that distance, very, very difficult. So not a full all out aggression coming out from Rise Nation, but they do have some questions they're going to have to answer as we do see. Pittsburgh Storm winning in the rotation. Oh, yeah. Yep. Circle heavily behind. And if they take any damage, this is going to be an oh, easy no, turn for Pittsburgh Storm. If you're Pittsburgh Storm, the second you enter that circle, you are looking to deny Rise Nation from anything. Absolutely. Also saw Rise actually checking their own backs to make sure that nobody else was at Ridge. So uh, Pittsburgh Storm is not going to be aware of this, but they have even a little bit of extra time. Rise Nation actually going to decide to balloon out to go all the way towards the northern part of, excuse me, now the southern part of sorting. 
we'll, we'll see if this gets them. I, I think this may be too bold of a rotation. Yes, that may get you out of the uh, out of the opponents that you just saw, but you're now trekking into territory you have no information on, and to yep. be walking into that with already, you know, looking at the entirety of all their armor and HP with at best 75% of your effective tools. Right, and it's also that low ground that's just to the left right now, actually a Pittsburgh Storm right along yep. the tree. Not only that, but then they're also going to be forced up through these terrible chokes from tree into thermal that we've talked about, which is no fun. So they have not really set themselves up for an easy road into thermal. No, and I think the counterpoint to that, or a counter alternative just direction they could have gone with that is just follow. Just follow Pittsburgh Storm. If you have information on them, then take the one that you know and then deal with it a little bit later. If they do end up turning on you, at least again, you understand the environment that you're yep. kind of handling at that point in time. But it's not like Pittsburgh Storm has decided to turn around high pressure. I don't think they even discovered them with that low ground kind of tree decision making. I'm curious if they Watson up here, because this is not only an option, but it's quite a common scenario is that a team will gatekeep right here. They have this little high ground in this choke. They can watch teams coming from tree. They can also angle themselves away from thermal as they please. But right now, it looks like they're going to do a little bit of scouting on station as well, just to see what the lay of the land is. But very rare. I mean, so many squads left, and they've certainly gotten to that choke first. You can bet that there's going to be a lot of teams trying to fly through there. And I'm, I'm trying to play the you know mental map game in my head right now, but if I'm Pittsburgh Storm, where do I think Rise Nation rotated? They have to be behind me. There's almost one area they could have gone, it would have been through the train tracks itself, but in all other cases, they had to be behind me. And I didn't see, at least from the perspective we got, anybody really too concerned. Right, there. I mean, if you look at the map, there are not many options. Essentially, that was the one line. And now they're getting flanked by them because no one has looked around. It's not going to be a full direct flank, but it, it's just surprising. Again, yep. knowing that information and uh, the circumstance considering that one round. I agree now, looking at the side of MHR and also Sentinels checking back in with them. Setting up here in Thermal, all Watsoned up. Looking pretty good in the way of armor as well. 99 and a Peacekeeper for Sentinox. Pretty good defensive posturing here on this building. One of the better ones to be able to hold up, at least in the early to mid, until you get better understanding of what that late game is going to do. I feel like for them, it's more just about the information they gain in the future and questioning whether or not they can get some of those shots. I'd be curious to I wonder what some of the other weaponry for some of the members of Sentinels is currently. Uh, the 99 Peacekeeper clearly very much in that close range. And this is, uh, at least right now, where we're existing here on the side of Thermal. And what's interesting about Thermal is there's a lot of interior spaces throughout this zone, but they're all quite scattered. And, and as we continue to get smaller and smaller, teams are going to be forced out of those interiors. So a lot of places to hide, but things are going to get pretty thin within these next few minutes. World drop out there, not too far here from MHR. Wonder if they may try and make any transition for a big play. It seems like the general consensus so far uh, over the weekend for both EMEA and North America has been more if it falls on your lap. Nobody willing to take any kind of risk for those. And understandable considering they really, outside of the Kraber Mastiff, definitely not so much the L-Star. Doesn't have too much to be desired so far at this caliber of play. Now checking in also with the rogue side. Bro, is Sentinels letting that team just play below? I guess so. You hear right there, Sweet asking. Yeah, no, they rest them. That's fucking dumb. If Sentinels is letting that team play just below them in the first level of the building that you see Sweet firing some wingman shots at. Big game job. I feel like they have to make some kind of transition. And I'd like to see it a little bit sooner rather than later. It does seem like some of these teams are going to push, be pushed upward a skosh here by this circle whenever it ends up identifying its next rotation. I, I guess for most of these teams, that will dictate what is the thought yeah. process. It is going to be northern, and Thermal Station shouldn't be that long term. Right, and a lot of the edges of Thermal just got... Uh, essentially negated here, as we do see a lot still of the western and the south in, but a lot of anyone who is near the station, anyone who's near the eastern side, Thermal Ridge, anything closer to the tree side is going to be needing to move pretty darn soon. Now looking at TSM, how the only one on blue armor. We had a worse rotation, we're fine. My last game rotation was Yesterday, I was talking about Thermal Station and some of those end circles that we can't get around it. I was talking about that house with the pipeline that goes across that very much looks like that is going to be it, and if not, just on the outskirts of it. It's the main structure still in it outside of that X building you see on your map. Mm -hmm. And right here is the team, Rogue, sitting in the middle of it all. Uh, it's very weird because there's many different angles it can be approached from. You can even get on top of some of those pipelines and like walk across. That being said, at the coordinated level here, I don't think 
that kind of stuff is going to happen. Uh, but it isn't the easiest to be able to defend out. And you can actually crouch on the sides of the building to where nobody can see your head. So there's this weird camping trade-off too. You see how it unfolds here. FlyQuest though struggling. Taking a look here. Caselos of the Goon Squad. Vusby already down. Just Fade and Casello is trying to work together on this building. We'll listen in as they figure out exactly how to play this out. Once again, FlyQuest, dire situation for them as well. One thing you did hear Rep saying on the TSM side was that we do have several minutes where they can post up. They know that they're going to be safe for at least that long. Yeah, and TSM, at least so far, seems to be you guys gonna kill? Yeah. Giving the most of forethought to some of those moments. Like, we, you, were, you were highlighted perfectly on some of the decision making on what floor do we take and why yeah. uh, from TSM. And uh, Onset as well as uh, showcase some of the greater elements of why TSM is as threatening as they are there as a roster. And I think that's showcasing it again within the comms. And so for me, it's always the okay, if you're safe for now, I want to know, I want to hear you you know, play through the idea of when you do have to make that transition, how does that go about? Because again, they're very, very good at it. Here's Team Secret now, 13th for them. One of our invited teams. Real bold decision making to move through that blindly. Yep, that's going to be, I believe, a Kraber as Yusuf gets knocked. And if not, some kind of sniper longbow, something just absolutely smash that HP bar. That was going to be the it's charge rifle in that feed probably coming out of Muffins. I believe it was actually the Gibraltar. Yeah, it has to either be something like that there. I believe maybe the Gibraltar did end up moving to that world drop I was talking about and pick mm -hmm. it up, but we'll see. Solful here. Making his way over to the thermal station on the inside. He's sitting on the left-hand side, allowing him to get a little bit of defense towards their side flank. Yeah, we kind of see the continuation of the Pittsburgh Storm story. Eventually did not get flanked, moved fast enough to, to continue through, but now taking this low ground on thermal. Anyone who's played end zones around here, you know this is not easy to fight out of. They're going to really need to shoot together and also cross their fingers that they don't get targeted by too many squads. Team shot at once, and now Fnatic NA with this top central thermal hold. But the next circle is, yes, going to force Fnatic off of this. They've been here for a long while. Fnatic knew that they were going to get on top of Thermal. They knew that was going to be the high focus and they were going to maintain on that positioning. But we still got 16 squads, 15 squads. And now it is time for them yep. to join the rest of the ranks. And I'm not sure that they have the armor looks good, but everything else is questionable. And we'll have to Great see. Thermite. Like you said, everything moving west into much more open territory. And still what's interesting no is way. you have some buildings further south that are still in as well. Those really outskirts all the way down towards the bottom left. There's four buildings in thermal there that are down towards the southwest that are still in play. For a second there, I thought that they were actually going to portal to try and get that kill, but I think that's the death of Fnatic if they decide to do so. Sentinels on their transition out. Here's the four buildings I'm talking about. They're all the way tucked down here. Hold on, hold on. I need Watson. Let's go ahead and listen in to uh, Sentinels. Presumably, though, they're just going to be Watsoning up and ulting up. I'm going to start looking for damage. One bat, four cells. I have three bats. I'm dropping that. And I have eight cells. I'm dropping I want to... Is it possible? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, hold this door. Is it possible for me to get out and drop fences on the sides? Yes, it is. It's okay, watch out. I want to look for so as you see them just poking around, you hear Senox talking about popping a few fences around outside. You have to imagine that there's at least one to two more teams in these four buildings down in the southwest corner. Yeah, and these fences on the side of this building type are actually super effective uh, because it's actually pretty hard to get the high ground angle enough to shoot out the Watson fence, and you can't get up there without climbing and walking right into one. So you already deal with the fact that your gun is already down, your head is exposed to your opponent, but then you can't even move. Very, very crippling there. Talking about unable to move, goon squads lose themselves. Seos, and only one member now still alive on their half. TSM actually lost to Albro Lely, though, Bravo. Yeah, I think we also saw CLG in the kill feed go down, so another early exit for them. Yes, I have one. I'm popping it right now. Albro does go down, and now an ult excel. You need to keep it. For reps, wow. he goes down. That's the Kraber there from Rocker. Yeah, it was Rocker was the Gibraltar who ended up picking it up there and throwing out the shots. That's the second knock he's had with an immediate headshot. Very, very threatening on that Kraber shot so far. The Youngins and Frex, big winners out of yesterday. Not so noisy here yet today, but they look pretty well postured yep. up here for this game to maybe change that outcome. Just what I was going to say. When we talk about the value of real estate changing quickly, they have actually have a pretty safe zone that has given them some good angles, but they are getting shot by those southwestern buildings. They're going to need to be aware of that the entire time while also angling themselves towards more central thermal. And that is Sentinels, I believe, on those southern buildings, the ones you were talking about before, whereas they're more focused about the building I was highlighting. That being said, 
My building's not that end zone. Yeah, you know, that south section is where everybody's got to rotate, and Fnatic is the team trying to do that here. Already losing two members there. Shiny, the only one left. Once he gets out of the rift, likely going to go down, see if anybody gives him enough breathing room. Phoenix will be available. You can't have Phoenix here. I was going to say, no, no, no. But then Sentinels is here. Might still get this Phoenix off. Hold your breath. That's the only way it happens. <gasps> Maybe enough gunshots happening upstairs where this Phoenix not only gets <sighs> off, but he did it. Did it. No one pushes down, and uh, let's see if he can get some extra points for Fnatic EU. As a reminder, just taking a look at where they are on the table now in seventh place. So not only are they in the money right now, but really still part of that top block of teams here. Sentinel's looking good, though. Glancing outward, and as we see the highlighting of the next circle, uh, how calculated their positioning and posturing really was. And at this point, I have a really hard time imagining Sentinels struggling in this game, especially with how Watson's up they have been here. Um, I'm trying to think of what would be the outlier case. I think the biggest thing that I would do want to bring to light, ooh, as Imperial Hal actually gets sniped down. Blue there with his scout being able to pick it up. So that means we only have one member, if any, of TSM alive here, and it would be reps. We're gonna have to fucking fight our brains out, though. You should probably take another gun. You should probably take another yeah, gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got my Arna. I got Arna and PK right now. We're good, big man. Lou and Monsoon talking together about there's how they are here. going to need oh, that's okay. Try to fight through this together. Oh, no, no, there's not. There's not. Something definitely went awry there. I don't know what is not, but it doesn't sound good. Monsoon, without any shielding already, ended up going back through the portals. Seems like he was chased by that target, then swaps through the armor, actually keeps himself alive a little bit longer. Trying to get the full retreat, makes his way back to Monsoon, but then we see so many targets, the circle now closing in on them, they can't take it. Then we see the grapple over, now underneath Sentinels. Monsoon with zero HP, really to his name, losing all his armor. Makes it over the wall? No way! How does he... Third base slides all the way underneath the building as well, but now taking a look at the Young Guns and Saucer trying to queue out here. Lots of pressure coming into his building as well, and things are now converging all the way down. Six squads left in the game. And there was a Kraber available there if anybody wants to go for some no-skill plays at this late in the game. Mastiff, though, in the hands of Sweet Dreams here for Rogue, which look very, very good here. Six squads remain, all three alive. And having an opportunity. Huskers did just take a chunk of damage along with Rogue, though, so they need a couple of seconds to restore balance. But I, this is looking very, very good here for a struggling Rogue this weekend. Yes, it is. Dropping some heavy there is sweet. More drop. Thing. Now thinking about breaching here. Going to take out the fences and fly in together. But now also looking at fly quest here. Wow, well, soon able to get all of his shields back as well. Now trying to push Sentinels. this. He's going to go straight upstairs. Not a lot of room for him, though. Lou all the way down to about five. HP just no. by he will go down now. Monsoon also chunked down. Monsoon goes down. That's going to be only a self rest left for them now. Taking a look at Shiny, still alive down below Dread. Oh my gosh, but the fact that Retsy barely, barely survived and won that fight, and I'm not sure that he's going to be able to he heal up all the way. Sentinels had such a dominant position, and a two man flat quest almost broke all of that. Here you see Sentinels trying to res up, trying to heal up. Do they push in this window now hearing this res? Sentinels? You're gonna get it. See the miracle. Get the heals though. If he can, right now they're protecting, of course, on the wraps just to make sure he doesn't get pushed while phoenixing. Portal into the circle. There goes Retsy. They're gonna be ready to go right now. Mastiff though, still in the hands of Sweet. Picks up another one on Shiny. That's gonna be a Mastiff to the dome. Yeah, it leaves us with three squads in total as well. Trying to heal up in the downtime. The Gibraltar ultimate did go down on the outskirts. You see them now sitting on top of the roof. That's a very well shielded Sentinels. Actually, Retsy taking 75 there. Seems like it must have been one massive shot. Nobody looking to push in this window quite yet here, though. And they're just going to want to make sure that wherever they do, they angle themselves towards or away on the same line. What they can't afford to do is That's to get hit by two separate teams. Here comes a rooftop push. Some decent shots there from Senox, but he's getting melted from below as well. Retsy falling low on top of it. Everybody getting pressure. And I don't know if that was going to be the third party or, in fact, just the last three-man roster that we ended up witnessing. We'll see Sentinels. The fact that they're able to heal up is honestly very, very forgiving there for them. Peek at one. Once again, getting shot from two different angles as well. They need to be careful. They need to avoid that. He can stand on the generator and actually peek into the second floor if they actually try to get there and defend that out. It's a little trick that he can use on that elevation. They know that Sweet Dream still has that massive and Zomp. goes down. That's going to be dropped. He picks up a kill as well. Right there also gets dropped with two of them. 
Somehow, we okay, see Husker's. Sweet doing what it takes there, and Huskers comes through as well. Huskers now one shot. The Mastiff is going to be looking here at Saucer. Saucer and the Young Gun, somehow all three members staying alive. Now only one squad left. One challenger remains. It's, is it? Is it? I think we already saw, we saw, we saw. I thought it was Red. Yeah, that's it. That is going to be in the end indeed. It had to have been Rogue, right? I think it was just one rogue player who was remaining as we, of course, also, we saw earlier Fnatic EU dropping and that will be the end of the game. I think I think it was a uh, self-res shield like that kept him alive a little bit longer there at the end because it did seem like they did have full kills onto both Sentinels and right. onto Rogue there at that point in time. But the Young Guns. Young Guns. The Young Guns, yeah. it, 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 which it should be noted yesterday twice or maybe more than that, I don't know. Um, I might have called the Youngins and Frex the Young Guns and Frex. So not to be mistaken with the team that has had three victories over so far, right. the Young Guns have had a tough weekend here. And it's their first victory. They yes. come into this game in 11th place with uh, 36 points total. We'll have to see exactly how many kills they had to their name as well to see if that brings them within the money at, and into the top eight. A strong performance from them, also a strong performance to get that late from Rogue. We saw a big double coming in from Huskers. We saw some great Mastiff play from Sweet as well. Yeah, Sweet, I mean, I, that that has to be, in my opinion, the story of that last game. But yes, there was some cool, uh, interesting stories with Sentinels to some of the decision-making they made. You know, what happened to TSM with the pickoffs that came through. But in reality, uh, Rogue showed up and they also looked good in an yep. in-game battle and everything else there. And, uh, I, you know, I'm sure the analyst desk uh, has a lot to be able to say there over that last initiation coming out from Rogue. Thank you very much, Dread and Bravo. The Young Guns there coming away with the W. Glitter, you looked like you were pretty interested in how that final portion of the map was playing out. That was just a really good fight there at the end. Um, I think that was a really good game for Rogue to do well, and that was near where they dropped, so they had no excuses as far as rotations go. But at the end there, there we had FlyQuest, we had Sentinels, we had uh, Shiny was still up on Fnatic NA, and then we also obviously had Rogue, but Young Guns just had timing in their favor. They let everybody else battle it out. They let Rogue take a massive initiation up on Sentinels and clear them off the roof. And then after that happened, all Young Guns had to do was come up and clean them up because they'd already taken so much damage. Yeah, it's about timing. We saw it from LG a lot of the time yesterday when they were timing their pushes and initiations in those final circles. That was a perfect example of it there from the Young Guns. And again, one of our qualified teams showing that they have that kind of now send that knowledge towards the end game to be able to get these wins on the board. But big performance for Sentinels. Again, points on the board for them, kills on the board. Rogue, I think that's going to give them confidence moving forward as well. Mm -hmm. And also, it's just another example of how dangerous a gun like a Mastiff can be in those final moments. You've just got to hit a few shots, and before you know it, you finish in that top five. It's, it's a pretty comfortable weapon to use in those moments. Mastiffs can be scary in real life, too. <laughs> big, intimidating dog boys. Either way, guys, <laughs> um, comparing NA to EMEA, do you feel as though the qualifying, the qualified teams for NA have been performing better than the qualifying teams in e EMEA? 100%. I, I, I mean, I think we only have to look at the leaderboards to, to establish that. But the difference for me has been in the fact that it's the execution on the later games that has been more impressive for me from the qualified teams from North America, showing that maybe the skill pool is slightly higher. There's more good level teams who are more experienced in that end game in North America than maybe some of the qualifying teams that we've seen come through uh, from the EMEA region. I think there's just that maybe the pool of talent is a little bit bigger. doesn't surprise me too much to say that because that normally is the case uh, with North American esports, but there's still a lot of talent in the EMEA qualifying teams. And uh, yeah, it's just shown there those end game situations, they're not flustered, they're not uh, uncomfortable in being in them and they're able to execute. All right, everybody, that will draw to a close match number nine. The Young Guns taking away the champion. The champion's banner will be back after a short break to check in with the scoreboard and the leader board before we head into match number 10.